Studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello and welcome to the CUBE Studios in Palo Alto, California for another CUBE Conversation where we go in depth with thought leaders driving innovation across the tech industry. I'm your host, Peter Burris. Almost everybody's heard of the term black hat and white hat, and it constitutes groups of individuals that are either attacking or defending security challenges. It's been an arms race for the past 10, 20, 30 years as the world has become more digital, and an arms race that many of us are concerned that black hats appear to have the upper hand. But there's new developments in technology and new classes of tooling that are actually racing to the aid of white hats and could very well upset that equilibrium in favor of the white hats. To have that conversation about the ascension of the white hats, we're joined by Derek Mankey, who's the Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances Lead at Fortinet. Derek, thanks for joining us for another CUBE conversation. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Very All happy right. to be here. Derek, let's start. What's going on at Forta Labs at Fortinet? So 2019, we've seen a ton of development, uh, a lot pretty much on track with our predictions when we talked last year. Obviously a big increase in volume, thanks to offensive automation. We're also seeing low volume attacks that are disrupting big business models. Uh, I'm talking about targeted ransom attacks, right? Uh, you know, criminals that are able to get into networks cause millions of dollars of damages thanks to critical revenue streams being out. Usually in the public sector, we've seen a lot of this. We've seen a rise in sophistication. Uh, the, the adversaries are not slowing down. Uh, AETs, advanced evasion techniques, are, are on the rise. And so, you know, to do this in FortiGuard Labs, to be able to track this and map this, we're not just relying on blogs anymore and, and uh, you know, 40, 50 page white papers. So we're actually looking at uh, playbooks now, mapping the adversaries, understanding their tools, techniques, procedures, how they're operating, why they're operating, who are they hitting, and, and what what might be their next move. So that's a big development on the intelligence side too. All right, so I mentioned up front this notion that uh, the White Hats may be ascending. Uh, I'm implying a prediction here. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we see on the horizon for uh, that concept of the White Hats ascending and, and specifically, why is there reason to be optimistic? Yeah, so it's, it's been it's it's been gloomy for for decades, like you said, and for many reasons, right? And I think those reasons are no secrets. I mean, cyber criminals and black hats have always been able to move uh, very, uh, you know, with, with with agility, right? Um, Cybercrime has no borders. Um, it's often a slap on the wrist that they get. Uh, they they can do a million things wrong. They don't care. There's no ethics, and uh, quite frankly, no no rules by them. Right on the white hand side, we've always had rules binding us. We've had to uh, we've had to take due care, and we've had to uh, move methodically, which slows us down. So um, a lot of that comes in place because of frameworks, uh, because of uh, technology as well, uh, having to move um, after it's enabled to it with frameworks, uh, specifically with you know making corrective action and things like that. So. Those are the challenges that we faced against. But you know, like uh, thinking ahead to, to 2020, particularly with the use of artificial intelligence, everybody talks about AI. You know, it's it's, it's impacted our daily lives. But when it's come to cybersecurity, on the white hat side, um, you know, a proper AI and machine learning model takes time. Um, you take it can take years. In fact, in our case, in our experience, about four to five years before we can actually roll it out to production. But the good news is that we have been investing, and when I say we, I'm just talking to the industry in general and White Hat. We, we've been investing into this technology because quite frankly, we've had to. It takes a lot of data, it takes a lot of smart minds, uh, a lot of investment, a lot of processing power. And that foundation has now been set over the last five years. If we look at the Black Hats, it's not the case. And why? Because they've been enjoying living off the land uh, on, on low hanging fruit, path of least resistance because they've been able to. So one of the things that's changing that equilibrium then is the availability of AI. And as you said, it could take four or five years to get to a point where we've actually got useful AI that can have an impact. I guess that means that we've been working on these things for four or five years. What's the state of the art with AI as it pertains to security? And are we seeing different phases of development start to emerge as we gain more experience with these technologies? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's quite exciting, right? Um, AI isn't a, this universal brain that, that solves the world's problems that everyone thinks it might be, right? Uh, it's very specific. It relies on machine learning models. Each machine learning model is very specific to its task, right? I mean, you know, uh, voice learning technology uh, versus autonomous vehicle driving versus cybersecurity is very different when it, when it comes to these learning purposes. So, so in essence, the way I look at it, you know, we, we, there's... Um, three generations of AI. We have ge generation one, uh, which was the past, generation two, which is a current, where we are now, and then generation three is where we're going. So generation one was pretty simple, right? It was just a, a central processing le a machine learning model that will take in data, it'll correlate that data, and then take action based off of it. Mm -hmm. um, some simple inputs, simple output, right? Uh, generation two, where we're currently sitting, is more advanced. It's looking at pattern recognition, more advanced inputs, uh, distributed models where we have you know, sensors lying around networks. I'm talking about I even IoT devices, uh, security appliances, and so forth, that still report up to this centralized brain that's learning and, and acting on things. But where things get really interesting moving forward in 2020 gets into this third generation where you have, especially, you know, moving towards cloud computing, or sorry, um, edge computing, is where you have um, uh, localized learning nodes that are actually processing and learning. So you can think of them as these mini brains. Mm. Instead of having this monolithic centralized brain, you have individual learner nodes, individual brains doing their own machine learning that are actually connected to each other, learning from each other, speaking to each other. It's a very powerful model. Uh, we actually refer to this as federated machine learning in our industry. So we've been, first phase, we simply use statistics to correlate events, take action. Yeah. Now we're doing exceptions, uh, pattern recognition, or exceptions and, and building patterns. And in the future, we're going to be able to further distribute that so that increasingly the AI is going to work with other AI so that the aggregate, this federated aggregate gets better. Have I got that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's the advantage of that? A couple of things. Um, it's very similar to the human immune system, right? I mean, if you have, you know, if I were to cut my finger on my hand, what's going to happen? Well, localized white blood cells, you know, localized, not, nothing from a foreign entity or further away in my body, are going to come to the rescue and start healing that, right? It's the same, it's because it's interconnected within the nervous system. It's the same idea of, of this federated machine learning model, right? If a security appliance is to detect a threat locally on site, it's able to alert other security appliances so that they can actually take action on this and learn from that as well. So connected machine learning models, it means that that uh, you know, by properly implementing these these AI, uh, this federated AI machine learning models um, in, in an organization, that that system is able to actually, in an autoimmune way, be able to uh, pick up uh, what that threat is, be able to act on that threat, which means it's able to respond to these threats quicker, shut them down, to the point where it can be, uh, you know, virtually instantaneous, right? Be before you know the, the damage is done and bleeding starts happening. So, to so speak, the common base, the blessed. common baseline is constantly getting better, even as we're giving opportunities for local uh, local uh, managers to uh, perform the work in response to local conditions. Uh, so that takes us to the next notion of uh, we've got this federated AI on the horizon. How are people, how is the role of people, security professionals going to change? Uh, what kind of recipes are they going to follow to ensure that they are working in a maximally productive way with these new capabilities, these new federated capabilities, especially as we think about the introduction of 5G and greater density of devices and faster speeds and lower latencies? Yeah, so you know the, 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 the world of cyber, computer, uh, cyber security has always been incredibly complex. So we're trying to simplify that. And that's where, again, this, this federated machine learning comes into place, uh, particularly with playbooks. Um, so, you know, if we look at 2019 and where we're going in 2020, we've put a lot of a, a lot of groundwork, quite frankly, into pioneering the work of playbooks, right? So when I say playbooks, I'm talking about adversary playbooks, knowing the offense, knowing the tools, techniques, procedures, the way that these, uh, cybercrime operations are moving, right? And, and the black hats are moving. The more that we can understand that, the more we can predict their next move. And that centralized language, right? Once you know that offense, we can start to create automated blue team playbooks, so defensive playbooks. That human, that, that uh, um, security technology can automatically integrate and respond to it. But to, to get back to your question, we can actually create human readable C, uh, CISO guides um, that can actually say, look, there's a threat, here's why it's a problem, here's, uh, here, here are the gaps in your security that we've identified, 
um, here's some recommended course of action as an idea too, right? So that's that's where the humans and the machines are really going to be work to, uh, working together. And and quite frankly, moving at speed, being, being able to do that at a machine level, but also being, being able to simplify a complex landscape, that is where we can actually gain traction, right? That This is part of that ascendancy of the White Hat because, um, because it's it's allowing us to move in a more agile nature. It's an, it's allowing us to gain ground against the attackers. And quite frankly, it allows us to start disrupting their business model more, right? It's a more resilient network. In the future, this leads to the, the whole notion of self-healing networks as well. That quite frankly, just makes it a, a big pain. It disrupts their business model. It forces them to go back to the drawing board too. Well, it also seems as though when we start talking about 5G, that the yeah. speeds, as I said, the speeds, the density, the reduced latency, the uh, the potential for uh, a bad thing to propagate very quickly, uh, demands that we have a more consistent, coherent response uh, at both the machine level, but also at the people level. Uh, we 5G into this conversation, What's what will be the impact of 5G on how these playbooks and AI start to come together over the next few years? Yeah, it's 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 going to be very impactful. It, it is going to take a couple of years, and we're just at the dawn of 5G right now. Uh, but if you think of 5G, you're you're talking about a lot more volume. Uh, essentially, as we move to the future, uh, we're we're entering into the age of 5G and, and edge computing. And 5G and edge computing is going to start eating the cloud in a sense that more of that processing power that was in the cloud is starting to shift now towards edge computing. Right? That this is that on-premises. So, a it is going to allow models like I was talking about, federated machine learning models uh, fr from the uh, the White Hat's point of view, which again, I think we are in the driver's seat and a, in a better, you know, more advantageous position here because we have more experience. Again, like I said, we've been doing this for years with the Black Hats quite frankly haven't. Yes, they're toying with it, but not to the same level and scale that we have. Mm. Uh, but, you know, you know, it's uh, I'm always a realist. This isn't a completely rosy picture. I mean, there is, it is optimistic that we are able to get this upper hand. It has to be done right. But if we think about the weaponization of 5G, that's also a very large problem, right? Uh, last year, we we're talking about swarm networks, right? The idea of swarm networks is a whole bunch of devices that can connect to each other, share intelligence, and then act to do something like a large-scale DDoS attack. That's absolutely in the in the realm of possibility when it comes to the weaponization of 5G as well. So one of the things, I guess the last question I want to ask you is you noted that these playbooks incorporate the human element in ways that are uniquely human. Uh, so uh, having CISO readable uh, recipes for how people have to respond. Does that also elevate the conversation with the business uh, and does allows us to do a better job of understanding risk, pricing risk, and appropriately investing to uh, and manage and assure uh, the business against risk in the right way? Absolutely, absolutely it does, yeah. Yeah, because the more you know about, uh, going back to the playbooks, the more you know about the offsets and their tools, the, know you, the more you know about how much of a danger it is, what sort of targets they're after, right? I mean, if they're just going, trying to look to, to, um, to, to collect a little bit of uh, information on, you know, to do some reconnaissance, that first phase attack might not cause a lot of damage, but if this group is known to go in, hit hard, steal intellectual property, shut down critical business streams through DOS that in the past we know and we've seen has caused four or five million dollars from one, you know, from one breach, that's a, a very good way to start classifying risk. So yeah, I mean, it's all about really understanding the picture first on the offense, and that's exactly what these automated playbook guides are going to be doing on, on, on the on the on, on the blue team end. Again, not only from a C-suite perspective, certainly that on the human level, but the nice thing about the playbooks is because we've done the research, the threat hunting, and understood this. Um, you know, from a machine level, it's also able to put a lot of those automated, um, let's say day-to-day -day decisions, making security operations centers. Uh, so I'm talking about like sec DevOps, much more efficient too. So we talk about more density at the edge amongst these devices. I also want to bring back one last thought here. And that is, you said that mm. historically some of the black hats have been able to act with a degree of impunity. They haven't necessarily uh, been hit hard. There's been a lot of slapping on the wrist as I think you said. Uh, talk about how the playbooks and AI is going to allow mm -hmm. us to more appropriately share data with others that can help both now, but also in some of the forensics and the, uh, the enforcement side, namely the, uh, the legal and policing 
world. How are we going to share the responsibility or how is that going to change over the next few years to incorporate uh, some of the folks that actually can then turn a defense into a legal attack? Threat illumination, this is what I call it, right? So again, if we look at um, the current state, uh, we've made great strides, great progress, uh, you know, working with uh, law enforcement. So we've set up public uh, private sector relationships. We need to do that, have security experts working with law enforcement, law enforcement's working on their end to train uh, uh, prosecutors to understand cybercrime and so forth. That foundation has been set, uh, but it's still slow moving. Uh, you know, there's only a limited amount of playbooks right now. It takes a lot of work to, to unearth and, and, and do to really move the needle. What we need to do again, like we're talking about, is to integrate artificial intelligence with playbooks. The more that we understand about uh, uh, groups, the more that we do this threat illumination, the more we uncover about them, the more we know about them. And by doing that, we can start to form predictive models, right? Based, I always say old habits <laughs> die hard. So, you know, if an, if an, uh, an attacker, uh, goes in, hits a network, and they're successful following a certain sequence of patterns, they're likely going to follow that, that's, uh, that same sequence on their next victim or their next target. So the more that we understand about that, the more that we can forecast, A, from a uh, mitigation standpoint, but the, the, um, also by the same uh, token, the more correlation we're doing on these playbooks, the more machine learning we're doing on these playbooks, the more we're, we're able to do attribution. And attribution is the holy grail. It's always been the toughest thing to do when it comes to research, uh, but by combining uh, the framework that we're using with playbooks and AI machine learning, it, it's a very, very powerful recipe. And that's, that's what we need to get right and move forward in the right direction. Derek Mankey, Fortinet's Chief of Security Insights and Threat Alliances. Thanks again for being on theCUBE. Hey, it's a pleasure. Uh, anytime, happy to talk. And I want to thank you for joining us for another CUBE Conversation. I'm Peter Burris, see you next time.